This is at the after show of Gotta Run, where we're going to talk to Roger Robinson. Roger. Hi, Will. Very nice to be here again. Roger, that was a fascinating discussion you had with Gordon Bakulis. I can't wait for the general public to get to see it. I can't wait for the general public to read the book you know, and, and preferably buy it. <laughs> well, I think to get the full experience, you must read the book. But I was curious uh, in hearing, because I had the privilege of watching it in the control room, and it occurred to me, because I visit your Facebook page quite often, that you do another kind of writing besides your best-selling books about running, and that's obituaries. Sadly, every week, some pioneer, most of whom many have forgotten, but you haven't, that have you taken the trouble, the, your gift, to bring them back to life that one more time into your bit. Mm. So tell us, you know, what is it about obituary writing that's different from your historical writing, and, and what do you get out of it from doing such wonderful little snippets of, uh, of history? Well, it is, it's a form of historical writing because, of course, what I, you try and do when, when somebody significant has died is to say why they were significant and what contribution they made. And, and in my case, most of the obituaries I write are from the running world. Uh, I do some in the, in the literary world in New Zealand. I've done, I've done those as well. And I guess, um, in a way, it's something I can do because I've, I've got the kind of mind that can look at the whole picture and, and, and manage to encapsulate it in, in not, not too many words. Mm -hmm. So I've had quite a lot of experience of, of write, doing that kind of writing. Uh, I, I edited and wrote much of a book called The Oxford Companion to New Zealand Literature. And, and those weren't entries, but, but I was writing about a writer, sig fairly significant writer, in 400 words mm -hmm. or in 600 words, depending on how significant they were. Mm -hmm. uh, so I had a lot of experience of, of doing that. The obituary writing is, is rather like that, except that often, of course, it's, uh, you're also in some kind of shock and, and the readers are likely to be in an in, in emotional state. And so, as, for instance, when Alan Steinfeld died, you know, yeah. a major figure in, in New York, and we were all heartbroken, and somehow I've got to capture the significance of his life and recognize, you know, why we're all feeling heartbroken, but not make, you know, not make a big emotional deal of that. <laughs> you know, you get, the, you get the facts down and, and let them speak for themselves. Uh, so it's a worthwhile job. It's something that any culture should do. You know, obituary is an important part <laughs> of, <laughs> of the culture. Um, the New York Times uses make, makes a good deal of obituaries, and, and in our field, in the running athletics, we have one of the best obituary writers anywhere in Frank Litsky, oh, who yes. does brilliant obituaries. Mm -hmm. um, for the New York Times? For the New York Times, yes. Just, just yesterday, Lee, Lee Rimagino, who you wouldn't know, won the 100 meters in the 1952 Olympics completely unexpectedly, and Frank wrote an absolutely beautiful piece about him and his origins and how he came to win that race and how the track was wet, everything about it. So I try and do that and, and pay tribute to people, but also record their, their contribution to the history of the sport, which I'm interested in compiling. You mentioned Alan Steinfeld. I don't recall, was his a shocking death? No, he was young, yeah, uh, but yeah. he'd been unwell, unwell. And he'd really, and I wanted to hint at this without saying so, he'd never really been himself since his wife died oh, unexpectedly okay. a, year, a year earlier. And that, okay. that I wanted to hint, but without, yes, it, yes. it's not my business to say so, but I, I think that really shook out. Oh, and he was, never, he was never quite fully alive after that. I would imagine that some of the obituaries, you may have already, already sketched it out because, like you said, when it happens, even it's not unexpected. It's still a shock. And you have to get it out within a certain time. You already have some drafts. Yes, like, like, like all responsible journals, like the New York Times. Uh, I've worked with Runner's World, originally Running Times, and compiled something of a file of, of, of these drafts. Um, that, that's a, you can't possibly get it done. You know, when somebody dies, you might be on a plane or something, and, and so you've got to be prepared to an extent. Mm -hmm. So we do, we do have quite a number. You're not old enough to qualify. <laughs> <laughs> but it does have a funny side in, in that, you know, occasionally I'll meet somebody at a party and I'll want to say, oh, I was just writing about you. you uh, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> 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 when you remember what you've been writing. <laughs>
Oh, I actually went through writer's block at one point on it, which I've never done before. And when the editor said, we haven't had an obituary from you from some time, I said, no, because I realized that I just reached the qualifying age. So, <laughs> <laughs> so who would you like the person to write your obituary? Have you done your own already? No, no, I wouldn't dream of it. Oh, I don't know. He hasn't written obituaries, but, but, but one of the best writers I know is Jonathan Beverly, and, and, and I would be honored if a, a, a younger, uh, but very, very mature and wise writer like him would do it. Okay. Well, I don't think it's too morbid a topic to talk about obituaries. It's a, it's a thing that a lot of people look forward to reading. I, you know, and uh, it's, it's fascinating to read at times, to learn. And, I, and you do such a lovely job, you know, when I read them. I say, my gosh, I, you brought that person to life for that moment. And I want to thank you for, for doing that. Thank you. Thank you. It's not morbid. It's, it's, it's the, the, the chance of us, of us each needing an obituary sometime is, is exactly 100%. That's, that's right. That's right. <laughs> You're a mathematician. That's right. <laughs> the last time you were here, Roger, you, we talked about the Russell which is uh, one of your partial knee replacements. It was done in, I believe, in uh, New Zealand? Russell is a New Zealander. Okay. He's a partial replacement, and he's now seven and a half years old. Seven and a half years old. But then recently, he gained a brother, a half-brother. Well, tell us about his, uh, his sibling. I want to tell you first that Russell recently won a literary award. Talking of the different kinds of writing, writing that I do, uh, I was contacted by the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons to say that they'd seen a piece, slightly tongue-in-cheek piece, that I, I'd written about Russell, about how I'd managed to get back to serious level competitive racing on a partial knee replacement. And it was a, it, it, it featured Russell and, and told about why I, I call him that, etc. He's named after the surgeon. That's what I should explain to people who, 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 don't, who don't, don't know this story, the surgeon Russell Tregoning. And the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons is giving me, or I prefer to think of it as giving Russell, their Media Excellence Award for, for, for writing something which is uh, very good media publicity for the whole orthopedic profession. Uh, excellent. Yes. So, so, so he's the only need ever to win a literary award. That I know. <laughs> Did he have to travel far to get the award? <laughs> no, he has not. They sent it to me, which oh, is very, okay. very considerate. <laughs> and then Mark, you asked about Mark. So just uh, now a year and a half ago, quite suddenly, I got pain in, in the left knee. It came on so suddenly that I thought it must be just some kind of tweak but it didn't go away and it got worse and worse and eventually went and got x-rays and then MRIs. And it turned out that the cartilage in the left knee was completely gone. No, basically there wasn't any. <laughs> and how I'd managed to race through that last year, which I had done quite yeah. successfully, on that nobody knows, but I had until at some point, you know, something rubbed against something. And, and so then uh, I was fortunate enough to find a very good surgeon in Kingston, New York, in, in um, the Orthopedic Associates of, of Dutchess County. He's, he's called Mark, Mark Airstock. He is himself a triathlete of some uh, great ability. Uh, so he was sympathetic and uh, fully understood you know, my, my desire to be able to return to competitive sport. Unfortunately, when he went into the knee, he found it had to be a full replacement. Oh. which is much more serious so uh -huh. you, because you have to sever the ligament. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, and as, as a doctor friend said to me, they effectively, they amputate your leg <laughs> and then stitch it back together again. But anyway, so Mark is a full one. And so now I'm in, back in the experimental stage. He's, he's 10 months old. Mm -hmm. uh, and I began running um, after about jogging, you know, shuffling. After about three to four months, something okay. like that, I had a bit of a setback when I'd done some steps and, and uh, hurt something, not in the prosthesis. The x-ray showed the prosthesis is perfectly fine, in the right place, not mm -hmm. worn, not, not damaged. I've got back to it. And I'm now at the point when, in the last week, I ran 5K continuously without walk breaks for the first time. Uh, I've been increasing the total quantity of running, which I've mixed with walking, and that's been going up by one minute every few days. And a few few days ago, I got to forty-five minutes. That's not continuous. That's that's yeah. that's run a bit, walk a bit, run yeah, a bit, yeah. walk a bit. Uh, and I do some fast, faster, okay. eight hundred meters as well. So it's still all at the at the absolute best. 
ten and a half minute mile speed. It's not fast, but and I'd like it to get faster, and maybe it will, and maybe it won't. I don't know that uh, yet. Some people would be thrilled to be able to do ten and a half minute miles, or any minute miles, actually. <laughs> It sounds like uh, your experience on your first with Russell helped you considerably. It sounds like you progressed a little faster than you did with Russell. Yes. You were much more cautious. Yes. Well, I, the main reason for that, I think, Will, is, is that before Russell, the, the, that right knee had been bad for so long. I really hadn't run a step for about five or six years, whereas the gap this time has been much less. Ah. And the surgeon, Mark, said to me, well, it's your choice. He said, sooner or later, you'll need a replacement. For the other and, knee. and we were trying, yes, with the left knee. We were trying injections. They really worked in a limited way, but, yeah. but, but not in any way adequately. And I thought, well, you know, I'm, I'm this age, I'm in my late 70s. What am I waiting for? <laughs> you know, the sooner I get it done, the sooner I can get the benefit from it. Yes, yes. So I said, let's, let's, let's go ahead and do it. And so we did it. We did it last August. And... Now I'm in a position when I can look ahead and think, well, maybe you know, another year, new age group, all of that. Ah, ah new you know, might, might, might start might start racing again. Oh, okay, good, good. You know, when we talked last time, we were wondering if there were any other athletes that had knee replacement that were able to come back and run at a high level. Turned out there is the great Dick Grizzly. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I've seen his video, and, I, and I, in fact, I emailed him to make sure, and he had a, a full replacement. Yes. You know, and, uh, and he, he the common characteristic that, that you two of you share, you're very slender. And he said, being very slim and, in, and fit for the yes. operation was a huge... Being fit is good. Dick, I think, and I don't know the full circumstances, I think he came back too fast after the first replacement and was running marathons. Uh, I'm, more <laughs> that I didn't hear. I'm more cautious than that. And I'm, I don't think I'll ever run a marathon again. That, but sounds, I think, that sounds like Dick Pierce. Uh, yes, yes. Well, Dick, you know how he is. He's totally committed and, 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 and exuberant and all of that. A wonderful, wonderful character. But in a way, I, I've tried to be a bit more cautious than that. And I think it's important. You can't expect the body to adjust to something like this overnight. You've got to give it time. You've got to work it. You've got to slowly strengthen it. And as you say, I'm trying to do it slightly faster this time than last, uh, but not too fast, not, not to rush it. So I think my one-minute increments are a way of controlling that. It's astonishing how, how it builds up. In my head somewhere, and this is not exactly a target, but I'd like to do what I did after Russell, which is run for one hour continuously, on the one year anniversary. Ah, you have a goal. Yeah, it's, so, it's sort of a goal. If I don't do it, it doesn't matter, okay. but it's sort of a goal. If I okay. can, I'm up to 45 minutes total and, okay. and 30 odd minutes continuous okay. doing, doing the 5K. And I think by the end of August, we're still a month and a half away. I think I might get up to one hour. Well, we wish you the best on that. Thank you so much for dropping in. Well, thank you, Will. It's always, always a pleasure. Thank you. This has been a Gotta Run With Will moment.